Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Lady of the Lake by Andrzej Sapkowski. Dane reads. So this is novel number five and book number seven in the Witcher series. There's only one more to go after this actually, so uh, I will be getting to that one soon. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, after walking through a portal in the Tower of the Swallow, thus narrowly escaping death, the Witcher girl, Ciri, finds herself in a completely different world, a world of the elves. She is trapped with no way out. Time does not exist and there are no obvious portals to cross back into her home world, and the elves have cruel plans for her. But this is Ciri, the child of prophecy, and she will not be defeated. She knows she must escape to finally rejoin the Witcher, Geralt, and his companions, and also to try to conquer her worst nightmare. Leo Bonhart, the man who chased, wounded, and tortured Ciri, is on her trail, and the world is still at war. So what I think is cool is uh, like most of the Witcher books are kind of told with a framing device and this one's no different and the, the world of the elves is actually essentially our world. And here, So this is Ciri, uh, the introduction of her, we, and we get this. The fairy bursts from the water, for a moment presenting herself to the knight in all her alluring splendour. She darted towards the rock where her clothing lay, but rather than seizing her blouse and covering up modestly, the she-elf grabbed a sword and drew it from its scabbard with a hiss, whirling it with admirable dexterity. It lasted but a short moment, after which she sank down, covering herself up to her nose in the water and extending her arm with the sword above the surface. The knight shook off his stupefaction, released the reins and genuflected, kneeling on the wet sand, for he realised at once who was before him. Hail, he mumbled, holding out his hands. Great is the honour for me, great is the accolade, O Lady of the Lake. I shall accept the sword. Could you get up from your knees and turn away? The fairy stuck her mouth above the water. Perhaps you'd stop staring and let me get dressed? And so we get this, which I think is great. Are there sorcerers in this world? You know, people who practice the magical arts, mages, knowing ones. There's Merlin and Morgana, but Morgana is evil. And Merlin? Average. And she sits down to tell uh, Galahad this story. And she says, this story, she said a moment later, wrapping herself more tightly in the Pictish rug, seems more and more like one without a beginning. Neither am I certain if it is finished yet either. The past, you have to know, has become awfully tangled up with the future. An elf even told me it's like that snake that catches its own tail in its teeth. That snake, you ought to know, is called Ouroboros. And the fact it bites its own tail means the circle is closed. The past, present and future lurk in every moment of time. Eternity is hidden in every moment of time. Do you understand? No. Never mind. And actually, I love the Ouroboros as a piece of imagery. I've been thinking about getting it like tattooed, possibly around this wrist here, so that it goes around my wrist and is eating its own tail in a loop. So uh, we get this bit. I made some inquiries at the academy, she said a moment later. Hence, I know that you do not boost your divination with hallucinogens. I'm pleased about that, for I don't tolerate narcotics. I divine without any drugs, confirmed Cordwaramus with some pride. All I need for an iriscopy is a hook. I beg your pardon? You know, a hook. The novice coughed. I mean an object in some way connected to what I'm supposed to dream about. Some kind of thing or picture. Just like that in extra like um, insight into how divination works in this world. So um, I'm going to read you some more, again a little bit more context into that. In spite of widespread assurances, dream readers didn't remember even half of their prophetic dreams, a significant proportion of which remained in the Aniromancer's memory as a muddle of images, changing colour and shape like a kaleidoscope, a child's toy of mirrors and pieces of glass. Not so bad if the images were random and without even a semblance of meaning, then one could calmly wave them aside on the basis of I can't remember so it's not worth remembering. Dreams like that were called crap by dream readers. Worse, and slightly shameful, were apparitions, dreams of which dream readers only remembered fragments, only snatches of meaning, dreams after which all that remained the next morning was a vague sense of a signal having been received. If an apparition repeated itself too often, one could be certain one was dealing with a dream of significant aniric value. Then the dream reader, through concentration and auto-suggestion, tried hard to force himself to re-dream the specific apparition exactly. The best results occurred by making oneself re-dream it immediately on waking, which was called snagging. If the dream couldn't be snagged, all that remained was an attempt at evoking a given dream vision during one of the next periods of sleep by concentrating and meditating before falling asleep. That method of programming dreams was called anchoring. We get this great bit during a banquet. Um, Verily, Chamberlain Le Goff confirmed without a trace of amusement. There are plenty of tapestries like that in Beauclair. The master who wove them was a true master, but he drank an awful lot, as artists do. And so here we get some kind of context into the food that's being eaten. 
The sight of the table, arranged in a gigantic horseshoe, signalled emphatically that autumn was passing and winter was coming, Game of Thrones. Game in all possible forms and varieties dominated the delicacies heaped on great serving dishes and platters. There were hanging quarters of boar, haunches and saddles of venison, various force meats, aspics and pink slices of meat, autumnally garnished with mushrooms, cranberries, plum jam and hawthorn berry sauce. There were autumn fowls, grouse, capercaillie and pheasant, decoratively served with wings and tails. There was roast guinea fowl, quail, partridge, Partridge, gargany, snipe, hazel grouse, and missile thrush. There were also genuine dainties, such as field fare roasted whole without having been drawn, since the juniper berries with which the innards of these small birds are full form a natural stuffing. There was salmon trout from mountain lakes, there was zander, there was berber and pike's liver. A green accent was given by Ray Ponce, slate late spring salad, which, if such a need arose, could even be dug up from under the snow. Mistletoe took the place of flowers. The evening's ornament was placed on a large silver tray in the middle, forming the centrepiece of the high table at which Duchess Anna Rietta and the most distinguished guests were seated. Among truffles, flowers cut from carrots, quartered lemons and artichoke hearts lay a huge sturgeon, and on its back was a whole roast heron, standing on one leg, holding a gold ring in its upraised beak. We get somebody going, don't try to apologise, I can't bear men who apologise. What kind of men can you bear? She narrowed her eyes and continued to hold her cutlery like daggers about to strike. The list is long, she said slowly, and I don't want to bore you with the details. I merely state that men who are ready to go to the end of the world for their beloved, dauntlessly, scorning risk and danger, occupy quite a high position. And those that don't quit, even though there seems to be no chance of success. And then we meet up with Dandelion, or Dandelion, however you pronounce his name, I don't know. Uh, he's been served dripping and scratchings in bed and they pay obeisance to him because he's in tight with the Duchess. And a great quote I liked here. Love, Fringilla said slowly, is like venal colic. Until you have an attack, you can't even imagine what it's like. And when people tell you about it, you don't believe them. There's something in that, the Witcher agreed. But there are also differences. Good sense can't protect you from renal colic, or cure it. Love mocks good sense. That's its charm and beauty. Stupidity. And uh, one of Geralt's many lovers says, a broken, heart, a broken heart, although it hurts greatly, a lot more than a broken arm, heals much, much more quickly. I don't know if I would agree with that. Uh, and we get a reference to drugs, which I always find interesting, especially in fantasy books. And also a little note on pronunciation here, because she's speaking Elvish, so... The next evening, for the first time, the older king betrayed his impatience. She found him hunched over the table where a looking glass framed in amber was lying. White powder had been sprinkled on it. It's beginning, she thought. Oberon used a small knife to gather the fist deck and form it into two lines. He took a silver tube and sniffed up the narcotic, first to the left, then to the right nostril. His eyes, usually sparkling, dimmed slightly and became cloudy, began to water. Siri knew at once it wasn't his first dose. He formed two fresh lines on the glass, then invited her over with a gesture, handing her the tube. Ah, uh, who cares, she thought. It'll be easier. The drug was extremely powerful. A short while later, they were both sitting on the bed, hugging and staring at the moon with their eyes watering. Siri sneezed. An uncharted night, she said, wiping her nose with the sleeve of her silk blouse. Enchanting, he corrected her, wiping an eye. And she asked, not enly ass. You need to work on your pronunciation. Leviosa, not Leviosa. And so here we get some um, graffiti. And this is at a time of war and it says, um, yeah. I'm just, I'm just gonna read it out. Siri, what are you staring at? On the wall of a granary visible at the end of the lane was a lopsided whitewashed slogan reading, make love, not war. Just under that, somebody had scribbled in much smaller letters, and take a shit every morning. Look somewhere else, idiot, Dennis Cranmer barked. Just for looking at graffiti like that, you can get into trouble. And if you say something at the wrong time, they'll flog you at the post. They'll flay the skin off your back. The judgments are swift here, extremely swift. I saw the shoemaker in the pillory, muttered Jane, reputedly for sowing defeatism. His defeatism, the dwarf stated seriously, pulling the boy by his sleeve, probably lay in the fact that when he took his son to his troop, he wept instead of cheering patriotically. They punish differently for more serious sewing. Come, I'll show you. Jesus. Oh, we get an astronomer and um, he goes straight, he always piss, it says, he always pissed straight from the terrace onto a bed of peonies, not caring at all about the housekeeper's reprimands. It was quite simply too far to the privy. Wasting time walking a long way to relieve himself bore the risk of the loss of valuable reflections, which no scholar could afford to do. I mean, yeah, I do get that because I'm a fiend for efficiency, uh, but also, you know, Sometimes the piss is when you get your moment of epiphany. I want to read this short uh, section out here. The strange construction in front of the cottage resembling a gallows was equipped with iron hooks and a block and tackle. The table and chopping block were worn smooth, sticky with grease and reeked horribly, like a shambles. In the kitchen, Siri found a cauldron of the pearl barley he had offered her, swimming in grease, full of pieces of meat and mushrooms. She was very hungry, but something told her not to eat it. She only drank some water from a wooden pail and nibbled a small wrinkled apple. 
Behind the shack, she found a cellar with steps deep and cool. In the cellar stood pots of lard. Something was hanging from the ceiling, the remains of a side of meat. She ran out of the cellar, stumbling on the steps as though devils were pursuing her, then fell over in some nettles, jumped up and ran tottering over to the cottage, grabbing with both hands one of the tilts supporting it. Although she had almost nothing in her stomach, she vomited very spasmodically for a very long time. The side of meat hanging in the cellar belonged to a child. So at times like this, I'm glad I'm vegan. And someone's uh, doing a little essay and we get, Very good, Nofis Nimu. I'd have given you a starred A grade had it not been for that so at the beginning of your contribution. We don't begin sentences with so. No, we do not. We also don't say, oh, I'm so hungry, unless we're following it up with, I'm so hungry that I could so and so. Ironic, the so and so. You can say so and so, just don't say so or so. And now uh, we get this lovely bit. I'm going to amputate some. No, yelled the injured man, thrashing his head around and trying hard to escape from Marty Sodergren's hands. I don't want to. If I don't amputate, you die. I'd rather die. The wounded man was speaking slower and slower under the effect of the healer's magic. I'd rather die than be a cripple. Let me die, I beg you. Let me die. I can't. Rusty raised the knife, looked at the blade at the still shining immaculate steel. I can't let you die, for it so happens that I am a doctor. He stuck the blade in decisively and cut deeply. The wounded man howled for a human, inhumanly. And now uh, we also get this lovely bit. Uh, what's up with him, Shani, in your opinion? Why such a face, girl? Have you only known men from the outside before today? The intestines are damaged, Mr. Rusty. A diagnosis as accurate as it is obvious. One doesn't even have to look, it's enough to sniff. Oh, can almost smell it myself, you know? And uh, interesting little bit here. I see Mr. Bonnard still has difficulty understanding the responsibilities of a guest, said Vilgefort, massaging his fingers. Try to remember, when one is a guest, one doesn't destroy the furniture or works of art, nor steal small objects, nor does one soil the carpets or inaccessible places. One doesn't rape or beat other guests, the latter two, not at least, until the host has finished raping and beating, nor un not until he gives the sign that one may now rape and beat. Right. I shall bear that in mind. Hello, uh, okay, so I don't know what happened. I lost some footage again. I do that all the time. So I don't have the outro to this uh, video, but I did rate it a four out of five. It was good. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Lady of the Lake by Andre Sapkowski. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.